Happy Friday, everyone. You are joining us on episode 48 of the Inkwell Gamers podcast. Dalton, do you want to kick us off today by basically going through our agenda for what we have planned to discuss? So, yeah, we only have a couple things planned. We're going to talk about our experience at Gen Con, and I do want to touch up on Bologna a little bit. So a little short and sweet episode for y'all, and let's just dive right into it. Do you want to talk about Bologna first? Uh, I kind of want to talk about Gen Con first. All right, let's get into it. So this is a little nostalgic for us because we're going back to where it all started. We actually got to attend Gen Con last year where Lorcana was released, and so... It brought back some fun memories of us basically spending the night in line. And in all reality, we probably didn't need to get in line as early as we did. Definitely not. No. We were like 20th in line, but there was probably only 30 of us in that line for like a solid five hours. So we probably didn't need to get there at 8 p.m. Thursday night or whatever that was. We probably could have gotten there at like 4 or 5 a.m. We weren't risking it, though. (laughs) (laughs) We weren't risking it. We saw online the chaos of what it was the day before. And as we laid in there in bed, I just kept saying, I don't I don't know if we should risk it. I don't. This is all I was excited about for Gen Con. I mean, it was my first one. It was your first one in a while. And yeah, I didn't want to risk going there the next day and them selling out of it so we did it and slept on the floor before they came around and told us that no one could sleep on the floor so (laughs) that was fun but we did not sleep on the floor this time and sadly they didn't even release set five early which I kind of thought that they might have but once Wednesday rolled around and obviously no one was talking about it and it wasn't announced or anything like that. I kind of lost hope thinking that, all right, they, they're they they're not going to do it. But. Yeah, I think that Ravensburger does a lot of really good stuff, but I think they could have really done something special for Gen Con. I know Wizards of the Coast, they do really interesting things for Gen Con. Of course, they've been around for a lot longer making magic than what Ravensburger has been making Lorcana, so there's still time for them to develop. Like, Mm -hmm. it's only been a year, right? But, like, I think they could have had some really sweet tournaments instead of just, like, the scheduled tournaments that they had. Um, Because the side events were, and we'll talk about it, too. We did a couple, but there were, like, three rounds of Swiss. Yeah, like... Magic, they did this really cool thing over the weekend where they re- they invited a bunch of different content creators in and then just kind of surprised them with what's called like a mystery booster draft. So uh, it was essentially just a draft full of r- a bunch of really awesome cards in frames that we had never seen before Frames and like alt art. alternate art from what they originally no, are. Yeah. Yeah. As well as just, they included like a bunch of play test cards and cards that they thought were like funny or had like jokes on them and stuff like that. And I think, I mean, of course they have 30 years of history to do that kind of thing with, but they also had, a really big tournament this weekend that there was some drama for. Um, but, like, the the winner of that tournament got a card that was worth, that sold on site for $48,000. Holy moly. So, I mean, Gen Con broke the record for attendance with over 70,000 people. And I think that would be a really good time to get a bunch of new people who might not normally go there for TCGs into a TCG with some really sweet tournament or setup kind of thing. Well, okay, so 
if they're going to do, if you wanted them to do a little bit of a larger tournament like that, though, that kind of tournament is going to bring in the competitive people that are already familiar with Lorcana. I think the side events that they, it's not side events, but you know what I'm saying, the the smaller events that they had done, I know that there were people in that that are already in the scene, but there were a lot of newbies there. So I feel like that was a good place to get their toes dipped. I think if they were to have added a big tournament like that, that wouldn't have necessarily gotten newbies into the game. That would have just brought in more of the competitive people who might not have been planning to go to Gen Con, but that would have been their reason to make sure that they were going to go to Gen Con. So... I mean, they had a bunch of the learn-to-play events going on. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what you're talking about with new people, which I think is, like, that's a good way to get new people in. But why not also want to bring in a lot of competitive players to the event as well? No, that's what I'm saying. But you're saying if they were to have added that big tournament like Magic had done, that that would have brought in new people to TCGs. At Gen Con, but I don't think doing that would have. Sorry, sorry. Maybe I should have said the wrong. People from other TCGs. Other TCGs. Okay, yeah, okay, other okay. TCGs. I see what you're saying now. I yeah. apologize. Yeah. I thought you meant like new to TCGs altogether. So yeah, I, I mean, I think if you market a, a card that's going to be worth fifty thousand dollars to the winner, then that could just bring in people who are you know, just really like games, mm-hmm. but also people who are in other TCGs as well. Yeah. Because so. there was another TCG that was announced at Gen Con 2 that, and not to take away obviously from the one that we're literally content creators for, but um, it has some nostalgia to it because it, I don't know about you, but I used to love Neopets. <laughs> um, that was definitely a thing I did in elementary school and I think middle school too. I don't even remember the exact years it was around, but Neopets is doing a TCG now and they launched it at Gen Con and we were in that corner where there was magic and Pokemon and Lorcana and there were people in that area that were talking about it like oh, I didn't realize that they were doing that now so it's you know that was kind of like the TCG corner and so yeah I mean I definitely think that there were people who would be likely to cross over between the different ones with that type of I don't know lure. Yeah, I I think it might have been a slight missed opportunity, but Gen Con does only have so much space. Although it is a very big convention center, you can do a lot in there. Uh, and they had like some rooms that were just for Lorcana. Yeah. So, I don't know. I think they, they could have done something really awesome if they wanted to. Maybe it just being a year in their... I'm just was, not ready for that yet. I know. I will say, too, though, like, Magic and Pokemon, their areas were, for T- the TCGs, were larger, but that's because that's all that that area was being used for, whereas Robinsburger does have, their bread and butter originally was board games puzzles, but and, like, this is their first one that is not that. And so yeah. they did divide that space up to half and half, and so... If you were to have considered what they used for even Villainous and their puzzle um, events too, and they even had like a color by number event too, like they had basically half of their space they designated for their other events as well. But I think if they were to have probably compiled all of that together, yes, but I don't think they would have even been maybe allotted the space to accommodate that. Because yeah, I mean, because they, they still want to accommodate their villainous and puzzle. Yeah, and now players. that they did, they did a longer tournament for villainous. Like that definitely lasted all an entire day, if not weekend. Yeah, they had a whole bracket going. Yeah, they had a bracket, and that was pretty sweet too. I definitely think that they could do a little bit of a longer tournament. Yeah, the three round tournament. I mean, we can just talk about them. Yeah, let's do um, it. Let's go into what we did. All right, so the first one we did was something that I had never really done before. It was split sealed and draft. Mm -hmm. So we basically got six packs, three of chapter three, three of chapter four. We opened chapter... Well, they're not chapters. We got to... Sorry, sorry. Set three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't know if they're going to... We don't know if they're going to come out with a chapter two later on, so... So set three and set four, and we opened the set three packs, 
all at once, and that was the start of our uh, limited deck. And then we drafted the set four packs, Mm -hmm. like you would a draft. So I had never done a mixed limited format like that. It was really fun. Limited in this set was harder than I thought it was going to be. So I thought I had like pretty good decks for both of our limited events and I think I went 2-1 the first one, 1-2 one, the second one and I'm not really even sure what happened in the games that I lost. I just found myself like down on lore somehow and yeah I just I just could never really recover I even like cast a turn five that amethyst like sing together song Mm -hmm. that lets you draw five cards I did that in one game and I still lost that game and it (laughs) like this probably makes me sound bad but it it was not really that close I, I I really don't know how uh, well, I can tell you why I lost that game. I played a uh, Champo, and then the one answer that my opponent really could have had was Hercules, uh, Rush Hercules, and they they had it. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> so if if they didn't have the Hercules, I'd probably win that game because the Champo would have protected all my characters from being challenged. But um, that's just it's not just unlucky. Yeah, I don't know. I just I found that like I think I'm pretty good at Magic Draft. I have pretty good card evaluation as far as that goes. But since I'd never done Lorcano Limited before, I wasn't sure how the games would play out. And yeah, because of that, I think my card evaluation was just not very good. <laughs> yeah, I had no clue what to even look for or assess going into it. I think the one thing you might have told me on the way there was look for card draw. Yeah. So that's what I definitely did. I I think I got one or two of the, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on her name, but the one magical character. Dolores. Um, yeah, Dolores. Where if there's an exerted character, you get to draw a card when she comes into play. So I feel like that's really the one card draw card I, that you really get from those two sets that I can recall. Aside from the sing together, but... I slept on that on because we did that event on Friday. Um, I I slept on that card on Friday, but then going into Saturday on the way home Friday, you were like that card got played against me, and I think that's pretty good. So then Saturday, that's what I looked for, and I did get that card, and I played it, and yeah, it that was good. What was it like second start of the right or something yeah, like that? Start, yeah, 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 yeah. That one was pretty good. You just play one, two, three, four, and then you sing. Yeah, the Sing Together uh, cards were a lot better than I thought they were going to be just because my my misevaluation of how the games played out was that there isn't really a lot of questing going on early because you just can't afford to make bad trades. So See, I was questing her. <laughs> yeah, that was my so, <laughs> well, I mean, you won your draft. <laughs> so, like, for instance, I picked Lumiere the two drop mm-hmm. red Lumiere over Isabella Madrigal. Mm-hmm. And I made that pick twice because I was thinking that there would be just a lot of characters on board and you would need uh, good ways to trade up with your characters. And Lumiere was a really powerful way at doing that. Mm-hmm. And that didn't really play out that way Mm -hmm. what kind of just happened was the board stalled my opponent would play i i don't some evasive character quest a decent amount with it um and then like some trades would happen but those trades would happen whether lumiere was in play regardless so i never really got to make uh, a lot of favorable trades and then once you get to a certain point your opponent can just kind of quest out with everything if they're ahead in lore because yeah. their other characters kind of just stay in play because there's not like any removal so you can go as wide as you need to and just keep your character safe until you have lethal on board and that's kind of what happened with me and Isabella Madrigal is 
like insane in those situations because it just quests for five. Yeah. <laughs> she's so good. Yeah. So I kind of miss evasive, a, right? Yeah. She's yeah. evasive too. So I kind of just misevaluated how the games would play out. And because of that, I made some really, really bad picks. And yeah, I think if I could redo that draft over again, it would play out just way different. Yeah. Yeah. I think my key takeaways for what I've learned, um, and we can, I mean, I, I guess I could go into how I did overall. I'll go into how I did overall first. Friday, I can't remember if I ended two and one. Or one and two. I think you were two and one. I think I ended two and one too. I can't remember when I lost though. I can't remember if it was my <clears throat> my second round or my third round. But anyway, two and one on Friday. Um, for Saturday, we did just a straight draft. So all six packs. Six? It was four packs. Four packs. All four packs was drafted. And that was just set four. And I won that one. I got the mat. And easy. And then the last event that we did was a starter deck chaos in which they essentially pass out the starter decks randomly. You can't ask them for a different deck, but if there's someone around you that's willing to trade you and you want theirs and they want yours, you can do it. And then you can use the pack that comes within the starter deck and then they give you one more pack that you can also use. So that one, I was two and one as well. I lost my last round. I was so close. I think I would have gotten it if they were, they played the, um, why am I blinking on? It's the one Dalmatian puppy where... Lucky. Lucky, yeah. They just played a character out and I, I just kept questing and questing and questing and then they like played and they didn't exert. I'm like, huh, that's weird. Cause I was just, I was going to get ready to challenge, but I was like, I'll just keep questing. And I actually got pretty lucky too. I, um, I opened up a Medusa and a McDuck Manor and I got the starter deck that was the Ruby Sapphire location one. So I was pretty much just using locations and with my Medusa too, with that starter deck, you also have the dragon fires. So I was just like removing, it was, it was awesome. And yeah, I was, I was, I thought I had it cause I, I Medusa them a couple, or I was able to Medusa them for a couple of the games and yeah, they just kept putting a character out, not doing anything, putting a character out, not doing anything. And I didn't see it coming. And then they played lucky out and then just Everybody quested, and then they quested for, like, 12 or 13 lore, and I was like, oh, my God, I lost. So that kind of sucked, but I can't remember if it was my Friday or my Saturday, but I also kind of played pretty heavy into the locations as well, and then I also did a lot of evasive. So that kind of ties into my takeaways. So aside from the card draw with um, Dolores and Second Start of the Right, I think evasives are pretty key especially because if you think about it aside from brawl the, um, the evasive characters are so strong so strong especially like tiktok you can't freaking get rid of tiktok he's essentially a bodyguard that they still can't trade into no, <laughs> like he, he, he trades pretty well into so many characters he survives a lot and he's evasive so they can't even challenge it back yeah it's insane he's essentially like an untouchable bodyguard. So yeah, evasives, so good. Because Dragonfire, like that's all in previous sets. And chances are if you're drafting, they're not you're not drafting chapter one yeah. unless you're doing a pretty sweet draft. That would honestly be a pretty cool draft. Yeah, but. so yeah, evasives are really strong. Most of the removal in the game does not come from set four, so you don't have very many ways to get rid of evasive characters unless you yourself have some so yeah removal in the form of brawl or if you get lucky like the rls legacy cannons that one can be good because mm -hmm. it's repeatable removal for uh evasive characters but yeah evasives just are really hard to get off the board and especially with a lot of the sing together stuff mm -hmm. it makes singing those eight cost songs or 10 cost songs less punishing because 
sometimes what happens is that you just seeing a uh, second start of the ride or whatever, and then your opponent has a chance to make really good trades into you. Yeah. Because all your characters are exerted, but if you have evasive characters, then they still can't challenge them. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, the evasive characters are extremely good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The larger locations, honestly, even Agrabah, even though it is somewhat easy to get rid of because it's only a five willpower, it gives you two lore per turn. So even if you get like a turn or two out of it, it's it's still pretty pretty good. Winter Camp, <laughs> I know it didn't see playing constructed, but it does give you that passive lore per turn. And even though the ability doesn't trigger too much, like there was a time where I had a larger character there and I like got rid of like a little rinky dink one of theirs and then the next turn I just quested and then healed myself. And so like I did that like once or twice, so that was pretty cool. But... Yeah, I saw you do that multiple times <laughs> in one game, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, <laughs> so... it was it was pretty fun. So yeah, evasives and um I did play Chen Po as a bodyguard as well. And then I had like Prince Eric in there just to, you know, whatever, but um bodyguards, evasive, larger locations that give passive lore. I did do Hidden Cove, so Hidden Cove, Winter Camp, and then if you're lucky and you get McDuck Manor, and then Agrabah. Um, yeah. Hidden Cove is also really good, just you can like augment three or four of your character's stats in one turn, mm -hmm. and then if your opponent thought that they were just questing with kind of impunity, then you can kind of just take out their whole board and mm -hmm. your board is still alive, yeah. intact a lot. So Something, and then I'll pass it to you. I'm sorry, I'm doing a lot of talking. Something that I got to do that was so fun, and you normally can't do this in Constructed because you can't play all of these colors. <laughs> I played Hidden Cove on turn one, and then turn two, I just played a character out. Turn three, I played the Ruby Tuck Tuck. And then I moved my two drop character and Tuck Tuck to Hidden Cove. And then I banished something of theirs. And then because I banished something of theirs, I played the Steal the Foo for free. <laughs> <laughs> I did that like three or four times. It was awesome. Yeah, probably more than that. I don't even know. But like, I remember doing that. I'm like, damn, this is awesome. Ah, that felt good. <laughs> it felt good. But like, because those are multicolored you can't you can't do that right yeah. but like it oh it was so much fun so much fun but yeah all right i'll pass it to you now how'd your day go dalton <laughs> uh so like i said the draft i went one and two the starter deck event i 3 would i got the mat whoop, whoop. um i had one close game out of the six i went 3 0 6 -0, didn't lose a game I had one close game, and then I top deck Grab Your Swords because I got the first set Blue Steel deck, and Grab Your Swords is ridiculously good. So, yeah, I just I was going to lose this game eh, very quickly. Top deck Grab Your Swords, it killed five of my opponent's characters, and then obviously I didn't have to trade into them, so I still had all mine, and I won in like two turns after that. So, um. Yeah, it went pretty well. Nice. What's what, what starter deck were you hoping to get? I was kind of hoping to get one of the first set ones, the Ruby Emerald one. I was kind of hoping to get because that one has a that one has some removal in it in mm -hmm. the form of dragon fire, but it also just has so many evasive characters. Yeah, it's Pongo, right? Yeah, it's Pongo, Goofy, the three cost Peter Pan. I think it has some of the Tinker Bells too. So it just has like all the evasive characters. So I was and kinda... the Aladdin. Yeah, it also has the Shift Aladdin. Yeah. So I thought that one would be pretty good. There's also um, there are a lot of bad cards in the first chapter starter decks, but because you get to take the bad cards out mm -hmm. and replace them with cards from the two packs that you get, like I think if you can do that, then they're definitely just going to be better than like the set what'd you get to swap out do you remember um like all the bad items like the coconut basket and the scepter of arendelle and uh was there anything good that that you remember putting in though yeah there was like the three drop gaston from set four the one that's uninkable but you can exert it to 
make your next character cost two less. Oh, yeah, So yeah. Uh, I was already playing a, a ramp deck, and then obviously this card fits perfectly well when I'm trying to play five, six, and seven cost characters. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty lucky. I got some other reasonable cards too, but I can't remember. Can't remember them. Um, so yeah, I, I think I got a good deck, and yeah, I don't know. It was fun. Do you have any takeaways for what you now know you need to look for in a draft that we didn't previously talk about or that might not have been on my list? Because I feel like we kind of condensed together, but... Yeah, card advantage and evasives are the two main things I'm going to look for. And depending on the the format, the removal is just going to be so scarce that I would like to pick up removal when I can and that usually comes in the form of rush characters mm -hmm. so like Hercules I think would be good but like Brawl even though it's like not super efficient Brawl is probably decent just because there's just not that many removal spells at all mm -hmm. so probably card advantage evasives and then removal which it's kind of funny because those are some of the best things that are good in Magic Limited too, or that's like the old school magic mindset. And then, of course, there are cards like Raya that I think are extremely powerful that I would take over most cards anyway. Mm -hmm. Just because when they hit the board, if the game was close, you're probably going to win. Yeah, yeah. Kind of up for debate. I, I think I drafted her twice. I think she just kind of performed mid for me, but the uninkable Namari, where it's like you deal the Free same. cost. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just felt like because you don't have that much removal, to me it kind of was like a less efficient Prince Eric, but obviously you're not doing a banish to banish. You're doing like two to two, although there are ways to almost kind of bump her up like yeah, Lumiere and Hidden Cove and stuff like that. Vitalis Sphere is in the set too so yeah like if I saw an Amari I think I think I might have passed one which was obviously very dumb now that I think about it but I would definitely be looking for something like Vitalis Sphere to give it rush and uh, power it up a little bit because mm -hmm. I mean that you're just looking for such a big blowout and it's that's a really high tempo play. So, yeah, removal and Namari is a really good piece of removal. Yeah, yeah. I would avoid, I mean, I know that this might sound obvious, but I would avoid any sort of almost too niche and specific synergies with different cards. I know that there are certain cards that obviously aren't played in Constructed, but don't be fooled thinking that they might be good in Draft. For example, like... Like the whole hero synergy still still isn't good in draft. You know, I, I took I took Anna, but I like never played her or, nor used her. My first round opponent in the draft, my opponent played Anna on turn two, and I think that thing quested for like ten lore. Oh. So they had a bunch of the four cost Raya's that unexert or ready a character. Mm -hmm. So they're able to quest for two ready it quest for two ready it and i just obviously don't have any removal in my deck so i just could never do anything about it and mm. their two drop quested for eight or something okay. so i think um proceed I think, with caution I, yeah i feel I mean, like my issue is i drafted what i thought was v they were very good cards but they were all allies <laughs> not heroes. So I did have a couple of heroes in my deck, but I think the frequency of the hero, like I had way too many more allies than heroes to where it just didn't hit. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So I get it. I guess it depending on, depending on what else you get, <laughs> but yeah, yeah I mean, that's a good point. I'm sorry. Yeah. If you can, I don't think you want to like first pick an Ana just because it's not like the most powerful card, but like, if you see one fourth pick and then one fifth pick after that, then in the first pack especially, I think you can really start drafting around it, especially because the Ruby Raya that I was just talking about is a common as well. And those two just work so well together and put on a lot of pressure that I think it's definitely doable. Mm, good point. Good point. 
Ready to move on? Yeah. All right, take us away. All right, so I just want to touch on uh, Bologna a little bit because the hero is back. The hero is back. And when I say that, I mean Ruby Sapphire 1. And not just any Ruby Sapphire deck, Dana. Marisa's workshop took it down. Nice. The Queen and Marisa's workshop, which I had been working on. I had tried that deck for so long, and I could just not figure it out, but... I remember when Maurice's Workshop first came out, you were trying that card out on Pixelborn. I was trying it out before set championships even. Yeah, I, I was I was playing with our group, and like it could do some really strong things sometimes, but it just seems so slow and you didn't interact that often early and i hated playing scuttle but i mean this person played four scuttles and they won so my what do i know um the thing that they did though that i did not do was they played the two cost gaston the four two reckless from set one and i'm guessing that card did extremely well for them. It stopped. So the the Sapphire Steel decks are playing Argus now, which is a 4-1, a yeah. quest for one, mainly because it stops Flynn Rider. Yeah. And it challenges the Queen's castle pretty well. So I had not tried Gaston. I think it's a really great addition, especially when you're playing Ice Blocks because... There are a lot of times when your opponent might, oh, they see that you have a Flynn Rider in play or uh, your Gaston in play, so their Flynn Rider is not going to trigger. So they just quest with their Flynn, and then you get to play an Ice Block and make a favorable trade there. And then your Gaston can also then trade with like the Sisu that they have next or continue challenging the Queen's Castle. Uh, it's just such a big character to play early, and like I was playing Pegasus in my recent builds, but I wasn't playing Ice Blocks. But if, it was just such a smart addition to play Ice Blocks and Gaston together. They are also playing the three cost unequal Sisu, which is obviously a really good combo with Ice Block as well. So I think they did a really good job of building the deck. I after playing set championships. Um, I kind of thought that Ruby Sapphire was underplayed a lot because it just still seems really strong and really good. So only like seven, it was only 7% of the metagame in Blonia, but it outperformed that going into top 64. It doubled that percentage in top 64, like 14%, mm -hmm. uh, which is really good. I think that and Blue Steel were the best performing archetypes as far as percentage to make top 64 over expected so i was really excited to see ruby sapphire do well i think it's a really powerful deck still and yeah uh ruby amethyst that deck did not perform very well it was like 25 percent of the day one field and then it made day two at like a 14 or 12 percent rate so that way underperformed what about emerald steel emerald steel was close to 22 percent or something like that but it only made 18 percent, mm -hmm. so it underperformed a little bit see that's night and day compared to fort worth it was because obviously like 50 percent almost 50 percent of the day two decks were right um right and you would yeah. think that with this truly being the last large competitive event before Bucky is like, let's face it, like, bye bye. Like, yeah, yes, the the card technically remains, but pretty much not. Um, you would think that it would be people's last hurrah, so people would bring more day one. But it sounds like not even that much brought that I mean, amount the, to day one, and it didn't even really perform well enough to make it to day two. Well, I think it was like twenty some percent people still brought it day one, so it was the second most played archetype but i think a lot of people were just playing the sapphire decks steel sapphire just wrecks that deck a little bit 
and that was the third most played deck. Also, uh, Amber Steel was, I think, the fourth most played deck, and that also generally has a good matchup against Bucky as well. So it wasn't really set up for Bucky to have a good send-off, which I'm fine with. So yeah, I. it was a very interesting tournament as far as results go, mainly for me because like an off-meta Ruby Sapphire deck one, obviously still doing most of the stuff Ruby Sapphire does, but I mean just the, the Maurice's Workshop stuff, it looks so good in the finals and like game one, it did not look promising for our hero, but he drove Maurice's Workshop off the top and yeah, that kind of, uh, kind of saved him in the end. So yeah, I'm really interested in seeing what's going to be in Toronto this weekend. It's the first DLC where Bucky is not legal. Yeah. So I kind of expect to see Ruby Amethyst uh, rise in popularity, but just playing more crabs and uh, two drop Kuzco's just so you have more card advantage and to help against other Queen's Castles and the Mirror and stuff. You don't have to play a lot of mediocre cards like the three drop maleficent in order to yeah because their game they had to completely change their game plan in order yeah. to accommodate bucky yeah so they don't have to worry about that as much so yeah i'm kind of excited to see what kind of deck lists pop up this weekend for sure yeah that'll definitely be interesting to see how that changes i feel like we will still see people playing emerald steel but I'm curious as to how it's going to look. Obviously, it's it's going to be completely different because you have to completely abandon your Floodborne game plan. It, I I know we've talked about this before, but I think it is going to probably look a little bit more similarly to how it did in set three, kind of bringing back maybe the the three cost Ursula and start double seeing stuff again and who know, who knows right yeah my guess is that curse we get Merfolk. some curse Merfolk action some Prince John action and I think <laughs> sorry, for... <laughs> sorry sorry if you hear sorry, our cat, cats but... <laughs> snuck into the room and now they're just sneezing and, and yeah. doing all this other stuff but yeah I think uh, we'll see more aggressive slanted version of that deck so i don't think that deck is going away anytime soon i do think we might see more amber emerald pick up that deck yeah has some really strong draws and it did not perform super well into the bucky decks a lot of the time just because they're so susceptible to the steel removal mm -hmm. but uh yeah i'm i'm pretty excited to see where the metal leads it is the last turn before set five so it's gonna be fun. Yeah, for sure. I know. And then, and then, what next with set five? What do you think? What do you think the metal will shape to be then? Do you think we'll see an emergence of any? Listen, if I don't see a Christmas deck similarly to what I played <laughs> set champs, I feel like that has some some legs. I feel like we're gonna see some more aggro. Yeah, I think uh, especially initially we'll see a lot of aggressive. Uh, amber amethyst decks but i definitely think that sapphire picked up some really important tools we're just gonna see a lot of ruby sapphire and steel sapphire i think i think i think those two decks have gotten even better and i think they're already the two most powerful decks in a vacuum do you feel like the emerald amethyst deck might come back it kind of went away not that it was ever really truly like super huge, but it was kind of making its way. I think that deck just has a really hard time against Sapphire Steel, so I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> but it is good against Ruby Sapphire and Ruby Amethyst, so we'll see. I'm going to start throwing out just ran Blurple. Blurple, no, no. That deck cannot exist. Sapphire uh, Amber. Sapphire Amber, no, no. Definitely not. That has some... I mean... We, we saw it at Set Champs. Did we? <laughs> Sapphire Amber? Yeah. I didn't play against With it. With Piglet. No. Okay. Sorry. I'm just saying. I'm not saying I want to play it. I'm just... <laughs> listen, I'm just trying to see no, if no. it would get played. Um, no, those... 
Like, for the same reason that Blurple's not going to be a real competitive deck, it just doesn't have re any removal. Okay, yeah. Like, it just doesn't have consistent enough removal to uh, help, to, to accommodate the Sapphire draw. Okay, gotcha. Listen, I'm just throwing it out there. Sapphire, did you say Sapphire Emerald already? No, you just said that. No, I oh, said, you Sapphire said Sapphire Amber. Amber. Uh, Sapphire. Keep up. <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. I want, I want that deck to work. S Listen, I want to ramp into Genie on the Job again. <laughs> I know. I want to ramp into. I want to ramp into that random Mickey artful rogue from Cell. <laughs> <laughs> you just, can do whatever you just want give me to, a bunch baby. of the random stuff i want to do that <laughs> but yeah i don't know we'll see it'll be exciting um picking up our products tomorrow and just opening packs hoping to get an enchanted what enchanted are you excited to open mufasa obviously oh okay what are you excited for i don't know i kind of like the art of archimedes uh, not yeah, like, like mechan mechanically, mechanically not Archimedes, but like art wise, Archimedes art is pretty sweet. I actually think Archimedes is good. Well, he's, so. isn't it am Amethyst, right? Yeah. And I don't play Amethyst, so I really don't care. <laughs> oh, well, I guess you'll have to start playing Amethyst. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Got to get used to the bounce. But anyway, should be a fun weekend. Hope Absolutely. you guys have some plans for Shimmering Skies and yeah. Let us know if you open up any sweet enchanteds. Absolutely. And with that, I think we're going to call it for today. Absolutely. We hope you guys have a great week and weekend, and we will talk to you next week. Talk to you next week. Mm -hmm.